Hello everyone. Welcome to the lecture series on disorders of potassium balance. First of all, I would like to uh, thank you on the behalf of all our non law team. Thanks for watching our videos. Uh, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so. It's a good resource for watching medical videos. All right. So this lecture series will be talking about the disorders of the potassium balance. In my first video, we will just go over again with the basics, which includes the homeostatic mechanisms involved in maintaining potassium in the blood. The second will be the disorders. First one will be the hypokalemia, low serum potassium disorders. And next will be hyperkalemia, which will be high potassium disorders. Okay, so potassium balance, if you look, if you look at the total body potassium, it's around 3,500 millimoles. A regular diet in a Western world, if you take, has around 100 milli equivalents of potassium that they consume each day. Before I get into this, the normal serum potassium is around 3.5 to 5.5 some say 5.2 milliequivalents per liter now when you consume 100 milliequivalents of potassium per day roughly around 65 milliequivalents is in the extracellular fluid and when it you can imagine when this much of potassium enters into the serum it can raise your serum potassium to 7 8 or 9 milliequivalents per liter which can give rise to fatal arrhythmias and we can die. That doesn't happen. So what are the mechanisms that are involved in maintaining the tight potassium balance? So as soon as one takes the potassium, it gets absorbed from the intestinal tracts into the blood. It is immediately taken into the intracellular spaces. Most of the potassium is stored in the muscle which is around 2500 milliequivalents and then to some extent in the RBCs, liver and the bone cells. And some of it remains in the serum and hence the serum potassium is maintained tightly. The main transporter for taking the potassium from extracellular into the intracellular space is the Na plus K plus ATPase which needs ATP. Then slowly serum potassium will be excreted, which is in excess 90 to 95 milliequivalents of potassium is excreted through the kidneys and remaining 5 to 10 milliequivalents excreted by the GI tract. Now I want you to remember this slide because as I go through the various different disorders, if you have this thing in your mind, it will be very easy to remember and follow what I'm talking about. So 5 to 10 percent is excreted by the kidneys, uh, sorry, by the GI tract, 90 to 95 percent is excreted by the kidneys. Most of it is taken intracellularly and is slowly released depending on the serum potassium. Now, as I said, there is a handling of the potassium by the kidneys and there is handling of the potassium by the GI tract and then intracellular uptakes by the various different cells in the body. Now let's look into each one of them. So renal handling of the potassium, you know, most of the ions which are filtered at the glomerulus are all absorbed by the PCT and the loop of the Henle for most of them. Same thing holds true for the potassium as well. Now approximately 20%, sorry, 10% of the filtered potassium will reach the distal convoluted tubule. And as the fluid travels down the distal convoluted tubule, there is luminal potassium concentration increase, meaning or suggesting that there is a net K plus secretion occurring along the DCT. So it means that in the distal part of the nephron, K plus secretion happens, whereas the parts of the nephron before that will be actively absorbing the potassium. Now I want you to remember these two channels, very, very important to understand how potassium handling happens in at the level of the kidneys. There is a voltage dependent renal outer medullary potassium channels which is 
R-O-M-K, also called as Ram-K channels. So put it in your heads, Ram-K, Ram-K, Ram-K channels, they are primarily dependent on the electrogenic epithelial sodium channel mediated sodium reabsorption. Now just remember what I am saying, I have a cartoon picture which will demonstrate this more clearly. And there is, as enhanced sodium delivery to the DCT occurs, there will be more K, K plus secretion seen, example being the loop diuretics. So here, although these are different types of channels, before I get into that, let's focus on to the ROMK channels in this picture here. So as the tubular flow or the tubular fluid is going through the distal convoluted tubule lumen, the sodium is absorbed by the epithelial sodium channel. When you take one positive ion into the cell, then you have to push one positive ion out of the cell in order to really maintain an electrical gradient. So absorption of the sodium will create an electrogenic force for these ROMK channels to open and secrete the potassium, suggesting that you need to present the tubules sodium to get rid of the potassium from here. And that is called as voltage dependent ROMK channels. So what do they need? They need sodium to be presented to the distal tubule which is absorbed by the cells in the DCT and that will generate an electrogenic potential leading to opening of the ROMK channels secreting more potassium. There is another type of channels called as BK channels or big potassium channels or maxi channels as well. They are present in distal part of the nephron which is DCT, CNT that is connecting tubules and the collecting ducts. At baseline they are not open, they are closed. It's only the ROMK channels which are mediating the secretion of the potassium from the tubules. However, under the high urinary flow rates, for example, loop diuretics, when you increase the amount of the urine that is coming, it will open these big K channels which are not voltage dependent. Remember that, not voltage dependent. So they will open up and they will secrete potassium more along with Ramke channels. Hence, loop diuretics tend to cause hypokalemia by this mechanism. Okay. Now whatever the sodium is in the cells, once it comes in through the epithelial sodium channels, it will be taken out through the 3Na plus 2K plus channels and it's a counter transport as you see there are three sodium channels go out of the cell two potassium will be taken into the cell from the bloodstream and this is an important co-transport as well so this is under the low flow state where bk channels are not active only ramk channels are active and in high flow state both channels are active leading to potassium secretion so two channels remember ROMK channels and BK channels located in the DCT. Okay, aldosterone we know is one of the hormone which is secreted from the adrenals, adrenal cortex in response to hyperkalemia. So, what does aldosterone lead to? Aldosterone through various different transcriptive mechanisms causes increase in ROMK channel transcriptions meaning they will lead to what more ROMK channel formation and hence when your aldosterone level goes up you lose more potassium you become hypokalemic as simple as that aldosterone is also secreted when aldosterone secretion is also mediated by renin angiotensin that is the RAS pathway hence it leads to activation of the sodium channels so you know epithelial sodium channel activation leads to what creation of the voltage gradient that in turn leads to ROMK activation and hence potassium secretion what does activation of the ENAC channels lead it leads to more absorption of the sodium whenever you absorb sodium water moves with it and hence you increase the volume and hence you become hypertensive fluid overloaded so aldosterone leads to what hypertension fluid overload hypokalemia so this is how it is important to know the physiology. 
now internal potassium balance now we talked about the kidneys now we are moving on to the cell part which how they try to maintain the serum potassium so there are different hormones which are involved in the potassium uptake by the cells like insulin which increases the cell uptake beta catecholamines increases the cell uptake alpha catecholamines a counter regulatory effect impaired cell uptake now physiologically how can you explain this that alpha catecholamines will lead to impaired cell uptake and beta catecholamines lead to enhanced cell uptake when you do exercise what you see is that when your muscles are contracting you are taking all the sodium in and you are secreting the potassium out so your serum potassium starts increasing as the exercise ends then when the muscles are resting at that point of time you will be reabsorbing the potassium back and getting rid of all the sodium out at which time you need this differential activity of the alpha and the beta blocker beta catecholamines receptor mediated activation to maintain the serum potassium acidosis promotes cell uptake alkalosis promotes sorry alkal acidosis impairs cell uptake alkalosis promotes and then cell damage will just release the potassium into the cell hyperosmolarity is also known to cause hence sometimes patient with intracranial bleeds who get mannitol can have hyperkalemia some of the other organs like thyroid adrenals exercise and growth can increase the activity and lead to hyperkalemia there is diabetes potassium deficiency and uh, chronic renal failure can impair it there is an important thing that you come across in clinical um, scenarios when you are dealing with a case of a potassium disorder either hypo or the hyperkalemia and that is called as ttkg or transtubular potassium gradient why i am explaining you this to you now is because when you are investigating or trying to find out the cause for hypo or the hypokalemia apart from looking at the serum electrolytes and some of the urine electrolytes like urine potassium urine sodium this this is a helpful test to know whether there is a renal loss of the potassium or not so what is ttkg ttkg is basically looking at the excretion of the potassium in the urine as you know it varies with two things one is dietary potassium intake so that factor has to be taken into second thing is if you if the urine is concentrated then the normal potassium in the urine will appear as more and if the urine is dilute then the normal potassium appears less in the urine so in order to counteract those things what you take is the concentration of the urine by taking the osmolality of the blood in the urine and with that you put in a formula and you come up with the ttkg so the expected values are less than 3 to 4 in the setting of hypokalemia meaning that if you have hypokalemia means the kidney should not be excreting but if it is high it means the kidneys are losing it that's how it is helpful same thing with hyperkalemia when you are hyperkalemic you should lose in the kidneys so values normally should be high 6 to 7 but if they are not then it means that kidneys are not getting rid of it so that's that's an helpful test what's an alternative to ttkg is you can do what is called as urine potassium to creatinine ratio um it gives you a value as well less than 30 ml equivalents um is caused by non renal potassium loss you can check you have to check urine sodium why as we learned earlier that you need to deliver sodium to the distal tubules to create a action potential sorry electrogenic gradient for the romk channels to secrete the potassium so checking for urine sodium is very important when you are you when you are calculating ttkg for hypo or hyperkalemia case what are the consequences of hypokalemia so this is when your serum potassium falls below 3.5 Uh, it's a known risk factor for atrial and ventricular arrhythmias especially in peri and post operative period typically you see flattening of the t waves st depressions u waves and prolongation of the qt intervals it leads to muscle weakness due to hyperpolarization on the contrary cardiac muscle depolarization happens through a different type of channels called as kp k2p1 channels 
which is known to permit sodium entry when there is lack of potassium. This is the reason why they develop these different arrhythmias, ventricular and atrial arrhythmias in the setting of hypokalemia. Uh, some of the renal manifestations of the chronic hypokalemia include sodium chloride retention, polyuria, it's seen in kids and you know with Bartels and Gettleman's diseases which we'll talk more in the later lecture series um, how they develop it and that happens because of the vasopressin resisting defect resistant defect in the urine concerning ability phosphateuria you are losing more phosphate increased ammonia, ammonia genesis um, when you biopsy patients with chronic hypokalemia you see sometimes proximal tubular vocalization and with renal cyst formation which can lead to end seasonal disease in, in some of the patients. What about hyperkalemia? Again, hyperkalemia will lead to depolarization of the cardiac myocytes leading to various sinus bradyarrhythmia, sinus arrests, then slow interventricular conduction, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, asystole. It can present as type 1 Brugada syndrome, which is RBB pattern with that is right bundle branch block pattern with estrogen elevations in the precordial leads. There is something called as ascending paralysis, which is associated with hyperkalemia, and that is also known as secondary hyperkalemic paralysis. You have to differentiate it from a, a disorder which is demonstrated in horses actually, um, called as familial hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Uh, again, reduced ammonia excretion and hence, hence ability to excrete acid load is impaired leading to metabolic acidosis. So remember, even with hyperkalemia, you can get weakness as you get with hypokalemia. And the mechanisms are slightly different, but think to remember that there is something called as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, just like hypokalemic periodic paralysis. What are the EKG changes uh, with hyperkalemia? A bold question. So, here is what I want you to imagine and this is the easiest way to remember uh, changes associated with the hyperkalemia. If you think of the EKG with P wave, QRS complex and T wave as a thread and hold the ends and just stretch it as much as you can, that's nothing but the EKG changes of hyperkalemia. So you know, except that, so first initially we'll see is a tall peaked T waves they say the classical description is that you, if you want to sit, you cannot. That's how sharp it is. Then followed by that, prolongation of the PR interval, decrease in the amplitude of the P waves with what is called as sinus arrest. There is no P waves. Then widening of the QRS complex. Then absence of the P waves, which is the sinus arrest. Then blocks, interventricular, fascicular, bundle branch blocks followed by sine wave pattern leading to ventricular fibrillation, asystole and death when the level goes above 8. So this is all about the physiology of potassium and uh, EKG changes in both the different disorders and some of the clinical tools to that helps you arrive at the diagnosis. Um, in the next subsequent lec video lectures, we will talk about the disorders of hypokalemia and disorders of the hyperkalemia. Thank you. Please subscribe to our channel on YouTube, All or None Law.